Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good, good, good. Yeah, uh, so my name is Jake, and uh, I'm excited just to be with you all this morning and to be able to share kind of the messages I feel like God's been uh, giving to me uh, as we've been walking through the book of Exodus. We're kind of getting towards the end. If you've been following along with our reading plan, we actually ended the book of Exodus in that plan. We're going to be picking up a new thing this week, but uh, we've just got uh, a couple more messages here in the book of Exodus. Um, And last week... um, Super exciting message about all the details of the tabernacle, right? Uh, that was, everybody was like really thrilled with that. And it was a great message. I'm not trying to like make light of it, but sometimes, like I think about this. Um, so maybe, maybe you've been in this position before where um, New Year rolls around and like resolutions are going on, or maybe like you're like, this is the year I'm going to read the Bible like all the way through in a year, right? And then like about February, you hit that Exodus, like, journey. You're like, this is a really cool story. And then you hit, like, 10 chapters of, like, the intricate details of how this temple is put together and the clothes that the priests are going to wear. And you're like, this is where I, this is where I check out. This is, this is where, like, my Bible reading for the year or, like, my, my plan to get through it in a year uh, kind of tails off. And I get that. Um, I understand where you're coming from there. Uh, you wouldn't be alone in that. But Uh, I am excited. We're going to be talking about the priests inside of the tabernacle today, inside this tent that God sets up for his uh, presence to dwell with his people. And, uh, and I think there's some really cool things that we can, we can get out of it. And so uh, before we get started with that, I, I just, I need, I need some help this morning. I know that church sometimes is not like this person talks and you are all silent. That's, I need for like five minutes, I need you guys to participate for a moment. So, uh, just bear with me, please. Okay, so we're going to do a little thing where we're going to show a, a picture here, and I need you to tell me, just based off the picture, what does someone wearing this uniform do? Fair enough? All right, let's try the first one. Police officer. Yes, perfect. This game is going exactly how I was hoping it would. Next one, please. Airline pilot. Perfect. Next? Referee. Right. All right, last one? Doctor. Perfect, right? The point that I'm making here is that sometimes the uniform someone wears automatically gives them like a role and a responsibility. You know, I didn't, these are all obviously like clip art images. They didn't need a face to them. They didn't need somebody there. It wasn't the person wearing them that necessarily means that they're a doctor or a referee or whatever. It's the uniform. It's the, the thing that they put on that gives them that position. And I'm going to try a different angle to this. So if we go to our next slide here, uh, this is Jeff. And uh, unfortunately, Jeff has the role this morning of kind of playing the, the other side of this. So uh, I just want to throw out a scenario here. So uh, Jeff here is um, going to try or attempt uh, to give you a ticket for something. Does Jeff, does that feel like Jeff has the authority to do that given what we see and know of Jeff so far? Does that seem like a trustworthy person that could just pull you over and give you a ticket for something? Right? Like, no, like, no, Jeff, like, get back in your car. I'm going to continue on my way, right? Uh, if Jeff were, say you're, you're at an airport and you're filing onto the plane and you see this person walking by and they're like, I'll be your captain today. I'm getting off the plane. Like, no, like, I, I'm good. I, I don't need to, to rest, risk my life on that flight, right? That you don't have the authority to do that. I don't trust your credentials to fly this plane. Uh, if you were to see Jeff throw a flag onto a field, is there a penalty? Well, come on. Like, we don't, we don't want flags at all. But, uh, you know, he's not wearing the proper attire. You get the point. And so what I'm trying to, to say here is just that we see that sometimes the attire, the uniform that someone puts on actually gives them an authority, a role, a responsibility. And this is what we see uh, as we kind of dive into this idea of what the priests were. Uh, there's going to be these really special, like, garments that are intricately detailed in the scriptures, and really the point is that the uniform that they put on gives them a special role and responsibility. It's not necessarily the people themselves that are so special, but it's this thing that they put on that gives them that, and that's going to be important for us as we also kind of look at what that means throughout the rest of scripture as well. Okay, now uh, let's jump into um, what these priests were. So uh, Exodus chapter 28 is where we're going to be. And uh, I I find it really interesting when we talk about these representatives, because there's something going back to last week's message that uh, is is an interesting tie-in here. And uh, if you you think about the tabernacle or the 
the tent that God instructed them to build. It had kind of three layers to it. You all remember this if you were here last week? So there's like the outer court, and then there's this holy place, and then the most holy place. And as it kind of, you know, come in, there's, there's less access. It's, it's more specific as to who can be in there and what they do, and there's specific t- uh, furniture and everything. Coming back to you now, yes. And so uh, what that, though, is really cool is that it actually is a parallel a little bit back to Eden, and what I mean by that, so uh, Genesis, the beginning, Genesis 1 through 3, we see the story of creation. We see that God put these two individuals into the Garden of Eden. Now, it doesn't explicitly state this, but just logically, if there is a Garden of Eden, then we can also kind of assume that there is a, a, a non-Garden of Eden, right? Like that Eden is the place, there's, the Garden is like a specific place inside of that. So if we draw the parallel here, then the outer court is kind of just Eden. That's, that's the place around. And then the holy place would be the Garden itself. And then the most holy place would be the Tree of Life in the very center where God would meet with Adam and Eve, where he's physically present with them. And that's where we see as the, as Russell laid out in the tabernacle, that's where the priests would go and, and physically meet with God and be kind of representatives for the people there. And uh, what's interesting about that is that we see also that like, if there are these two people in the garden that God were, gave them authority or gave them dominion, told them what they needed to do, then as he's trying to recreate that, so obviously they failed, they fell short, uh, sin has entered the world and things have gone into chaos for the rest of Genesis and Exodus, and now God's trying to give a new place for his uh, presence to dwell with his people, and so he's going to need new individuals to then represent him to the rest of creation, and that's what this priestly role is, and so it's actually a really, it's a big deal uh, to be a priest. I don't know if that was landing or not, but it's a, it's a huge deal, and the fact that uh, their role and their responsibility is really important too, and, and I want to break it down in kind of these two general points, is that they represent God to people, and they represent people to God, and there's a lot of nuance and specifics that we could get into, but just generally, like, this is the role, that they represent God to people and people to God. Okay, so now let's jump into actually reading the beginning of Exodus chapter 28. We'll read the first four verses first. It says, then bring near to you Aaron and Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me as priests. Um, Now, this is a continuation, really, of the blueprints for the tabernacle. And uh, as you see, a lot of the same kind of uh, similar things going on here. We haven't quite gotten into the details, but at that last line, they receive gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine twine uh, linen. That's, That's all like the same kind of elements or materials that were really used inside the tabernacle as well. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is that the, the priests and the tabernacle are really one. They're interacting kind of uh, together to uh, show God's presence and have him dwell with the people. And all these different garments are going to have their own significance, and these materials are really valuable. And again, this uniform gives them a role and a responsibility among the people. Without putting these on, they're just kind of people. Uh, but these, you, this uniform, this, this, uh, this dress sets them apart. All right, let's look at kind of what that means for them and, and what this, uh, this dress actually gave them. Starting in verse 6, it says, And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen, skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges, so that it may be joined together. And the skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it, and be of one piece with it, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel, six of their names on the one stone, and the names of the remaining six on the other stone, and the order of their birth. As a jeweler engraves signets, so shall you engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. And so the first point or responsibility kind of inside of representing the people to God and God to people that I want to make is this, that the priests carried the burdens of the people on their shoulders. 
The priests carried the burdens of the people on their shoulders. This is what the point that's being made by putting these two stones that have the names of the Israel families on their shoulders is that they would remember, this is who I'm representing when I come in here. If I'm going to be a representative of the people to God and God to people, I'm going to carry their burdens on my shoulders. You'd almost think about it like um, a backpack. So I used to be uh, a, a student pastor, and I can't tell you how many like four foot eight middle schoolers I would see come in wearing these backpacks that had like a thousand pounds of books in them. You ever seen like the, like the kid's way too small for the backpack that's like, and he's never, it's never tightened up to their shoulders either. It's like hanging below their butt and they're like, like walking like, the, like and so, you know, uh, that's kind of what I picture when I think of this, but it's, it's the idea that like these uh, stones that carry the names of the people are on their shoulders to remind them this is why I'm here, because I am carrying the burdens of these people to God. And, you know, oftentimes, like for us, like we think about, you know, coming to God in prayer, like I, I would say the most common prayer that we have is just like asking God either what to do in life or to provide us for something. It's sharing the burdens of our life with God. And this is what the priests are doing. I'm going to carry these burdens of the people into God. I'm representing them to God so that he can tell us where to go or what to do or provide for us or whatever that looks like. And that's what this piece of their garment was supposed to do. Now, uh, moving on to the next section, uh, beginning in verse 15. You shall make a breast piece of judgment and skilled work in the style of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen you shall make it. It shall be square and double to span, its length and a span its breadth. You shall set in it four rows of stones. A row of sardius, topaz, and carbuncle shall be the first row. In the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. In the third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. I might have butchered that, I'm going to be honest. Um, but we'll just keep going. It's a special rock. Um, in the fourth row, a barrel, an onyx, and a jasper. Uh, they shall be set in gold filigree. There shall be 12 stones and their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its name for the 12 tribes. Now, there is um, significance to the specific stones. We're not going to go into that today. What is significant for our purposes is that they are put into the chest of this piece, this garment that they're going to wear, the breast piece. It, they're... they're put in right over the chest of the priest. Uh, do we have, uh, Andrew, is that picture of the, the garment? Uh, yeah, perfect. Okay. So in case you're a visual person and you need to see the whole thing like laid out, I've got this for you. Um, you could ignore almost everything up there word-wise. Uh, I just want to point out to kind of, this is, the, uh, get a picture in your mind of what's happening here. So you see on the shoulders, those red lines that point to the shoulders, uh, that's where those stones uh, to remember the names are. Now, the stones in the center uh, are also stones that represent each of the 12 tribes. So you have the two on the shoulders that have six names each for the 12 tribes, and you have the 12 actual stones in the middle. Now, why would they, this seems like it's a little bit overkill, right? It's like the same thing over why is it on their shoulders and over their heart. This is where I think it's more, so we see them representing the people to God with carrying their burdens. I think this is where they actually represent God to the people and showing him his heart for them. So those stones over his chest are to remind them that they are to show God's love and care and affection to the people. And this is their responsibility, that they would represent the people to God, bringing their burdens, their things that they need, all that to God, and then showing God's heart back to the people. And that's why these stones are over their chest. The God's love for the people is represented by the priest. And this is what it means to be a priest, that you would mediate between God and man. You would carry the burdens of the people to God, and you could show God's love and affection back to the people. And it's actually this really beautiful picture of what it looks like to be an image bearer of God, to be a representative of God here on earth, that we would bear the, Im bear the, the responsibility, the burdens of people to God, and then also show his loving kindness to the people around us. And it, it's all like, it's, it sounds great. I'm going to foreshadow here that it, it doesn't go as great as it sounds like it should, but um, that's, that's really what's, what's happening here. It, it's, it's really cool. Um, the last thing I want to I show about these garments um, before we kind of look at the, how it goes kind of in the future, uh, starting in verse 28. It says, And they shall bind the breastpiece by its rings to the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, so that it may lie on the skillfully woven band of the ephod, so that the breastpiece shall not come loose from the ephod. 
So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel and the breastpiece of judgment on his heart. And then he goes into the holy place to bring them regular remembrance before the Lord. And in the breastpiece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart. When he goes in before the Lord, thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord regularly. Now, uh, I didn't want to skip past until we kind of talked about this Urim and Thummim real quick. Um, kind of because I just think it's cool, but also because we don't really have a great idea of what it's talking about. So just like, bear with me here as I kind of, uh, it, it's, it's thought to be, most likely, it's like two kind of rock-also-like pieces. And the, the general idea is that somehow these two rocks would let the priest know like a, a yes or a no essentially, like uh, whether it be that God was trying to lead them in this direction or that direction, uh, ask a, it's not like a magic eight ball necessarily, I, that my, like, if you're kind of connected, it's not like that per se, it's more so like uh, yes, no, like these two rocks kind of somehow decided, or maybe they weren't rocks, but whatever they were, like they decided kind of uh, what it means to, what, where God is leading them. Uh, I think, um, the, the, the literal translation is like lights and, um, and, and righteousness or something like that. And so this is totally just me speaking. This is not your, uh, you know, historian person, but leads you to the light, leads you into righteousness. I'm just like, that's, you know, that's kind of where, how I picture that. So these, these rocks, if you, if you read this and you're like, what the heck is that? Just so you know, it's, it's a way that the priest would have judgment as in judge for the people, what should, what's right, what's wrong, what they should do. Maybe there's even a court case that's going on and they're like, God, what, what's the right ruling here and kind of weigh between these two things, like what we should do. So that's, that's going on there as well. And that's kind of part of the priest's duty as well. And loving and caring for the people is, is judging amongst them. So that's the priests in Exodus, and they're given these special roles and responsibilities, and it all comes down to this, this special thing that they wore, and, and it's easy to kind of read that and be like, I have no idea what any of this means, but just know like, that's, that's the role and responsibility that they're given. They want to care for people uh, on behalf of God. They want to uh, show God's love to them, uh, to the people. But uh, unfortunately, like I mentioned, um, they did not do this uh, super well. Um, if we... Uh, look at kind of the, the broad picture of, of Scripture and what's happening here, uh, we recognize that they're actually kind of playing dress up. Like, we just had Halloween, right? And, like, kind of put on a costume or something to look like something else, but internally, you are still who you are, right? Um, that's kind of what's happening here, is that they are putting on these, these garments to be these kind of perfect representatives, these holy people that kind of manifest who God is physically on earth to represent him to the people and people to God. And, and that's all well and good, and it sounds really good uh, until you get to, like, where it all falls apart, and that's, like, a chapter later. Um, or, you know, like, not that long after where uh, literally as this is going on, uh, as Moses is getting this kind of command of what these priestly garments are supposed to look like, uh, down at the, the base camp uh, at the bottom of the mountain, uh, Aaron, who is supposed to be the, the chief of these priests, is being convinced to build a golden calf to worship. Right? We, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the, the golden calf story and what happens there. So, so literally, as God is telling Moses, this is the guy that I want to like, kind of take over this physical representation of me to the people and then people back to me, he's abandoning that calling to go and tell the people, like, hey, we need to you know, make this other physical thing to worship. And so immediately, it's like doomed to fail. And as we continue on, like Aaron's sons and their, like, fresh out of their, like, consecration ceremony. Yes, this is who we, God has called, which, by the way, it's interesting. Sorry, this is a rabbit trail, but it, it just struck me, like, that's happening. God knows about it. They have the whole scene where Aaron, uh, Moses goes down, and he's upset, and he burns the calf and makes him drink it, and just wild stuff going on, and then he sticks to the plan. Like, God still wants Aaron he, they still build it. He still calls Aaron to be the chief priest. He still, like, he gets to keep the job, if you will. And so I was thinking this week, as uh, if you're not aware, so Russell Schultz, our lead pastor, he is in France this week, uh, meeting with some of uh, some people that we have built a relationship with that are trying to plant a church there, and he's kind of checking out their work there and, and the potential partnership that we have with them. But I was thinking about, like, so what could I do that Russell might come back and be like, okay, like, you don't, you don't get to keep this job anymore? Because apparently, if we're going off of Scripture standards here, 
I could lead you all completely astray, and I just get to keep this job, right? Like, that's how God is working this thing. So anyway, uh, I don't plan on doing that, but I was just like in the back of my mind, like, what a coincidence that I'm talking about this. And, uh, but uh, anyway, so yeah, uh, it, it's going to go horribly wrong. It was already going horribly wrong as God was delivering the instructions for it to happen. Uh, Aaron's sons are going to screw it up immediately after they're like deemed worthy of going in and they light this fire they're not supposed to and whatever. And, and the future priests of, of, of Israel aren't much better. Um, they're not gonna. They're not gonna fix things, and so what we see is that the Bible leads us actually to this better priest. And uh, if you are been in church, like you know, like the church answer, like where is it always going? Like it is always going back to Jesus, right? And uh, I'm not trying to be like, uh, like we need to necessarily force it back to that. I think it, Scripture is very paints that picture for us that He is the high priest that they were supposed to be. Think about those general principles, those those general roles to represent God to people. Well. Jesus is God coming in human form. He is representing what the human person is supposed to look like if you represented and Im- like bared the image of God that was told to us in the beginning of Genesis. What about people to God? We see that Christ dies on the cross for us to represent us to God, that he might take on our sin and suffering uh, so that we wouldn't have to. Jesus is the ultimate high priest, uh, what Aaron was supposed to be but, but couldn't. And I think uh, what's really interesting um, I love this from Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, in the Old Testament, we're even kind of given this foreshadow, this, this idea that maybe this is who is to come. Uh, if you read this, you know, this, especially as we look forward to Christmas, this is a, a popular passage that kind of gets read around this time, but it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now, I want to focus on this, this middle line here, and the government shall be on his shoulders. There's this word for government. It, it, it's along the lines of like a dominion, a kingdom, a ruling over. And a, what does that make up? What's made up of a kingdom? Or, or it's, it's people, right? And so essentially what this is saying is that the people will be upon his shoulders. Well, what, is, what are the priests wearing? They're wearing on their shoulders two stones that show the, the Israelite names and the, those people that they're carrying those burdens. So this, this picture is actually foreshadowing that like, this is who the, the one to come is going to be, that he's going to be this better priest, that he's going to do a, a better job of bearing the burdens of people to God, of representing them to God as these priests were called to do but failed. Now, through his death on the cross, as I mentioned, God's love was poured out to all humanity. So he's carrying burdens and also showing God's love to humanity. And, and I mentioned how this kind of the priest never really got a whole lot better. If we just take a picture of something that happened in Jesus' time on earth in Matthew chapter 23, um, it says this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works that they do. For they preach but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. So again, Jesus is pointing out, this is the role that was given to them all the way back in Exodus, and they're not fulfilling it. They're not willing to carry the burdens of the people. They're actually putting burdens on, back on to people to carry themselves. And so um, as we kind of come to a close here, I want us to think about this. So, um, again, I, I made this point uh, a number of times in the beginning, but, but what was it that made the priests kind of have this special role and responsibility? It's not just uh, them, but what they put on. And, and what they put on was this bright, shining, like there's white, it's, it's all white underneath. It's meant to be like very, like, uh, bright fabric. There's these bright blue over the top. It's overlaid in gold. It's shiny. Like, literally, if they're walking down the street, there's no way you couldn't notice this person right? And it's, it's almost rem- reminiscent of, um, if you think about Moses coming down off the mountain and his face is shining, or there's a moment in the Gospels when Jesus is meeting uh, with some of his friends up on a mountain and his face is shining to them. Like, they're supposed to be the shining kind of representation that you cannot miss. And so they have this, like, super expensive, elaborate uh, clothes on to give them this role and responsibility, we just talked about Jesus being kind of the ultimate high priest, and in his pinnacle moment on the cross, he's wearing nothing. He's laid naked in front of everyone. And so the difference being that like, they needed this to kind of dress up as him, 
And when he comes on earth, he is only kind of clothed in our own sin and shame and guilt. What he puts on is our own shortcomings and failures and our shame and guilt and all the things that we need to to get rid of so that we can come back into relationship with God. He plays that role for us. It's almost like, um, I was trying to like workshop a little bit of this kind of analogy um, last night because I just, I just felt like, you know, in some ways it's kind of an abstract idea. Like it's really concrete. It's obvious that you can, the, the priest physically put these clothes on, right? But the idea of Christ putting on what we needed him to put on or, or putting on our sin and shame, that, that's, that's more of an abstract, like you kind of have to symbolically think of that, right? And so uh, an analogy that came to mind though, and I hope that this maybe crystallizes things a little bit for you if, if they're a little bit murky, is like, um, so pretend you're, like you're in front of a judge, right? And, and everything that you've ever done in your life is laid out. And uh, the, the sentence has come down that you are, are guilty. And not just guilty, but it's going to be a life sentence. You're going to be separated from the rest of the world for eternity, right? And just as you're kind of walking down the hall, uh, forgive me, I don't know exactly how this happens, but at some point you're going to get your orange jumpsuit uh, in order to like change into or, or whatever color that, that prison system uh, offers you. And, uh, and, and as you're like about to put on this representation of I have done wrong and this is my sentence, Someone else comes in and puts that on for you, gives you their clothes to put on instead, and you get to walk free. Like, this is the idea of what's being put on here, that Jesus puts on all of our sentence and shame and what we deserve so that we might put on his righteousness, his life, his opportunity to be one with the Father. And not just one, but a child of God. You mentioned that idea of like the role and responsibility. The role and responsibility that we get to take on because of Jesus is as child of God, as son or daughter of God, and then to have the responsibility that the priests were supposed to have, that Jesus did fulfill, to represent people to God and represent God to people. And so I want to invite the band up now as we uh, end our time, but I, I want to I want to just maybe kind of maybe pract- make this practical. So um, the first question is really like, for you today, have you put on Jesus? Have you put on Christ? Have you taken off the the burden, the sin, the guilt, the shame of this world that you have done wrong? There's there's an admittance, there's a humble uh, approach that needs to be taken there of, yes, I have done wrong, which I think we can all admit, whether you are a believer in Jesus or not, like we have all fallen short in some way. And so admitting that and then accepting, hey, I, but I, I want to I take that off so that I can put on the perfect righteousness of Jesus. I want to take that off so that I can put on his holiness, so I can put on his uh, perfect life so that I might have relationship with God. I might be a son or daughter of the king, and I might get to walk in that instead. And so that's the first thing. That's our role. The second thing is our responsibility. Because if this is what we've done, if this is what we put on, then we also put on. We, we need to live out what it looks like to be like Jesus. Again, going back to maybe Halloween, uh, you see kids running around, or maybe you have a special costume that you like to wear, no judgment as an adult. Uh, but, but not only do you put on the costume, you, be, you, you act like the character, right? Do you take on the, you know, what they are and what they do? And so this is what we do when we put on Christ. We, we do what he did. We represent God to people and people to God. And so I just want to ask some simple questions to you. This really like, has been weighing heavily on me, actually, as I've been thinking about this, because I don't know that I do this necessarily super well. Do you feel a responsibility to the people around you? We talked about the priests having these special garments where they have these rocks of the names of the people around them engraved and resting on their shoulders. That they feel the weight of those people every time they go into God's presence to represent them to him, to carry their burdens, to pray for them, to care for them in whatever way they need to be. And then the second is, do you feel God's love for the people? Do you feel that responsibility of representing God to them? That you need to show God's heart, that you can show God's care and love and affection to the world around you. As we model this priestly role and responsibility, that's what we are called to do. I think about even, um, you know, even make it more practical maybe for our our day today. Um, Over the last week, there's been a lot of turmoil in our country, right? 
regardless of whether you are encouraged or discouraged by the election that took place. Uh, you have an opportunity, and right now, I think there's a ripe harvest for the opportunity to share God's love and affection with the world around you, with people around you. We can be these image bearers. We can be these priests to the world around us to carry the burdens of the people to God and to show God's love and affection to the people in their lives. And this is what it means to be a modern day priest as God called the priests originally in the tabernacle. That's what we get out of this story in Exodus. All right, I'm gonna pray for us and we'll talk about how we respond to this. So God, thank you so much uh, for this message. Again, I, I, your word continues to just shape and form us and it never grows dull continues to have words for us to encourage us, to show us how to live, to show us what we should do. I pray that we would take on not just, um, first off, for sure, the role of being a son or a daughter of you. I, I just thank you so much for Jesus' sacrifice so that we might be able to take that on. But then also that we would recognize the responsibility that comes with that, to bear your image to the world, to, to care for them as you want to care for them, and to uh, care, bring their needs and in, in what is broken in the world back to you. Though we take on this role and responsibility as modern day priests in this world. We love you to use him and pray.